Because you know that. <laughs> Good morning as you're coming in. We're just going to share a song that we're going to sing later in the service with you. So feel free to just come on in and keep talking. But we just wanted to, to share this song with you so you kind of hear it before, uh, before we sing it as a congregation later.
good morning. We just want to welcome you to Liberty this morning. We're excited that you're here to join us. And, and uh, this morning we're going to start our service uh, singing some, a couple of songs, just praising God. And, um, and I, I just want to invite you to stand at this time uh, and as, as we just come before God and, and worship Him. And Would you bow with me in prayer as, uh, as we just kind of enter into this time? Jesus, we, uh, we just love you so much. We're so grateful for the opportunity we have to gather with friends and family and, and just uh, enter into your presence and, and just worship you this morning. And God, a lot of us walk through the, the doors this morning carrying a lot of different things and uh, some good and some bad. And, and Jesus, we just want to lay everything that's going on in our life at your feet right now. We ask God that you take uh, whatever it is, the good and the bad and the ugly right now, and, and that God, you just, uh, you hold that. And help us this morning, God, uh, just to look to you, to be encouraged in you, to hear from you. Jesus, we desire to hear from you today. We thank you, God, for this time, and we ask that you just receive our worship right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Strong. 
And they said, yes, we are witnesses. And he said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, for he is the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve, and only his voice will we obey. We live in a culture which is pressuring more and more for people to uh, sort of detract from what Joshua's message was. Uh, we live in a culture that basically says anything goes. And so um, it can be very, very difficult for a parent um, uh, to, to basically keep that uh, line. And uh, in Psalm 127, it says, Behold, behold. And when God says behold, it means this is a truth. This is not something that's negotiable. Behold, children are a gift from the Lord. And so basically what the Lord is saying in Psalm 127 is, um, you, you need to see this child for who they really are. Th this child is not to be just raised in any old way you want to. This child has been given to you by me, and I've got some expectations, which I've outlined in my word. That I want you to, to raise them in a way that basically points them to Christ. And when they see your life, they'll see an individual who loves the Lord with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, with all their strength. And so the purpose of child dedication here at Liberty is for parents to come forward, usually with a, uh, a newborn, but we invite parent, uh, children of all ages to be dedicated. But parents basically come forward and basically profess publicly, like the people during Joshua's time, who says, yes, we are witnesses. And so they profess publicly their own faith in Jesus Christ, which means they have come to a point in their life sometime, maybe when they were a child, maybe when they were an adult, when they realized that uh, they can't earn salvation through religion or morality or good works. It's only through the complete work of Christ on the cross that we are saved. And that requires a response. And so the parents are basically saying, yes, I have responded to Christ. He is my Savior. He is the only one. And then there's also a, a desire, since I have professed faith in Jesus Christ, I have a desire to publicly um, pronounce as well our desire uh, to raise these children in a Christ-like way. What this is not, this is not a means of salvation for the child, nor in Scripture do we see that. In fact, uh, basically throughout Scripture, it, it testifies that a, a, every single person must make a personal response to Christ. You reject Him or respond to Him. And so each one of these children will have to, at some point in their lives, either come to the point where they say, nope, I choose not to follow Jesus, or they say, yes, I'm going to trade Jesus for the rest of my life. Ephesians 2 makes it very clear. It is by grace you have been saved, and this is through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may be able to boast. And so what a privilege it is uh, today to have um, uh, two sets of parents uh, come forward and uh, with their young children and to basically profess their faith in Christ and, uh, and then also to uh, we dedicate the child to the Lord and ask the Lord's blessing upon them. So I'd ask those uh, families to come forward up on the stage at this time and um, we will introduce ourselves and then we will go into a time of dedication. Doesn't that make the stage look beautiful? Yeah, that is amazing. Yes. I mean, the carpet was good, but this is really good. So, we appreciate it. First of all, I'm going to ask uh, Dale if you would introduce uh, your family and who is up here on stage. And uh, we would appreciate you doing that. No. Okay, so I'm Dale. This is my wife, Carla. This is our oldest, Ella. She's 10. And our middle daughter. Our middle kids now, 
Adeline, and she's seven, and this is Reed, and he's five, and this is Clara Joy Hodgel. <laughs> The Rosa Bones. I'm Sean or Boomer. <laughs> this is our youngest Samuel and our 14 year old Carissa, 10 year old Caleb, and 16 year old Caleb and Heidi. Thank you. Appreciate that. Basically, the act of uh, dedication is pretty simple. Um, number one, I ask questions of the parents. Um, ask them about their own faith and their desire to raise their children in a Christ-like way. And then um, each of the uh, parents has a scripture passage that they will read on behalf of the child. And then we will uh, dedicate the child to the Lord. Start with you, Dale and Carla. Is that okay? Dale and Carla, do you publicly proclaim before these witnesses that Jesus, that, that Jesus Christ is your only Lord and only Savior? If so, say we do. Dale and Carl, as the parents of Clara, do you solemnly vow before God and before these witnesses that you will, with God's help and with God's grace, raise her in a Christ-like manner? If this is your desire, say we will. Dale and Carla, do you commit to modeling a life of obedience, a life of love, a life of devotion to Christ in front of Clara and the rest of your children, raising her up in accordance to the teachings of God's holy word? If this is your desire, say, we do. Do we have a scripture passage to read? The scripture passage that we chose for Clara is uh, Luke 18, 15 through 17. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And our prayer is that as she grows and as she gets big, that she continues to approach her faith in a, in a childlike awe. It's the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit that we dedicate you to the Lord at this time. We dedicate you to his love, his grace, and his mercy. And Lord, we just pray for this precious gift. Thank you so much for Clara. We thank you for the gift that she is. Lord, we pray that uh, she would grow to be a woman who is strong in faith, a woman who loves you and treasures you, and a woman who desires to serve you. Lord, I ask your blessing upon this child. Pray that uh, you would guide her and lead her. And we pray this all in your precious name. Sean and Heidi, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Do you publicly proclaim Jesus Christ as your only Lord and Savior in front of these witnesses? If you so do, say we do. Sean and Heidi is the parents of Samuel. Do you solemnly vow before God and before these witnesses that you will, with God's help and with God's strength, raise him in a Christ-like manner? If you so desire, say we will. Sean and Heidi, do you commit to modeling a life of obedience, a life of love, in a life of devotion to Christ in front of Samuel and your other children, raising him up in accordance to the teachings of God's holy word. If this is your desire, say we will. Do we have a scripture passage? Well, I asked if I could share, because this has kind of been a journey for me, doing this all over again. Um, so out of 1 Samuel 1, uh, 
Hannah says that after Samuel is weaned, then she will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And then out of Deuteronomy 6, 17 and 18, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you. And so that is our prayer for him, that he would choose to follow the Lord. Samuel Clark Rosenboom, it's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, that we dedicate you. We dedicate you to the Lord's grace, to the Lord's love, and to the Lord's mercy. And Father, I just pray uh, just what uh, was said, that uh, Lord uh, Samuel would be a young man who grows to love you, who grows to desire to serve you, who grows to uh, just uh, want to uh, uh, be with you at all times. May he treasure you. Uh, with his heart and with his life and with his mind. And Lord, we, we pray that uh, you would uh, uh, be with him. We pray your blessing upon him. We pray that you would guide him and direct him and be with him in this day and the days to come. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, if you read the scriptures, these parents are not the only ones that uh, need to make a commitment to these children. Um, anytime a person becomes a follower of Christ, they also become part of God's family. And uh, uh, there's local congregations um, all over the world um, that they can participate in. And since they have desired to participate in this uh, local church family, we are uh, a part of their family. And so I'm gonna ask you to stand and uh, I'm going to ask the congregation because we also have a, uh, an obligation as brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to these parents. Uh, to, um, so just uh, listen and then I will ask you to respond. Do you, the attendees of Liberty Evangelical Free Church, promise to support these parents in their desire to raise their children in a Christ-like manner? Do you promise to encourage them by praying for them? Will you encourage them through your words and through your friendship? Will you encourage them to remain faithful to the commitment that they have just publicly made? If you, uh, the people of Liberty Evangelical Free Church, so desire, please respond by saying, we will. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you so much for the families up here that are willing to proclaim and profess their faith in Christ and also their heartfelt desire to raise their children in that manner as well. Lord, um, uh, we, we just certainly need your strength and your grace to accomplish, which can sometimes be an insurmountable task. And so, Lord, we pray for that. Lord, I pray for this church family that uh, the commitment they just made, that they would be committed to these parents, these children. Lord, we thank you for the children's ministries and youth ministries and adult ministries we have which allow children to grow and to thrive. And Lord, I, pray, I thank you so much for those individuals who are willing to invest in the children and youth uh, here at Liberty. We just give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Thank you. Can we give them a hand and uh, congratulations? announcements and then we're going to go into a time of prayer um, but um, since uh, Larry Rosenboom is here known as grandpa uh, to the uh, child that was dedicated um, you know the grass grows a lot and it doesn't sort of cut itself on, on by itself and uh, so a big thanks who's been cutting this grass all season long basically Larry and the guys from Vanderbeek so we uh, appreciate for all the mowing that they've done um, senior Saints, if you're planning on going to Hidden Acres on Tuesday, we're going to take off from the front of the church at 7.30. Uh, we've got a good group going, and um, it's supposed to be in the 70s, but not raining on Tuesday, one of the only days where it's not going to be raining. And so Hidden Acres is just going to be beautiful. 
Um, high schoolers, um, maybe you don't go to the normal Thursday night thing, but this Thursday night we have something special planned for high school youth. Um, a person from Hidden Acres is actually going to be here um, at the church and uh, has some fun activities uh, all scheduled and uh, just going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things you can do um, there. Uh, tonight also, make sure you get to, to youth group. Um, Ryan Graydon, who is the adult program director, will be there. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going through uh, sort of a late midlife crisis. Uh, Ryan grew up in the church that I used to pastor. Uh, when he was wee little, um, was on my track team, uh, qualified for state in several events. And this past Tuesday at the Pastor's Wife Street in Acres, I saw him, and he had a little bit of gray on his beard. And I was like, a kid that was a baby when I started ministry is now gray. And uh, that really makes me feel old. But anyway, anyway. But um, so high schoolers, tonight, Thursday night, you're, you're going to want to make sure you're here. Uh, Thursday night, uh, Pastor Rob will let you know tonight or via email or text uh, what time that's going to be started. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask one of our elders, uh, West Chaplain, to come on up. And uh, we're just going to go into a time of uh, uh, corporate um, prayer and uh, pray for some of the needs of the body. And uh, appreciate West doing that. Thank you, Dan. Good morning. I am Wes Chaplin. I'm one of the elders here at Liberty. Uh, one of the things that we like to do here at Liberty, maybe unfamiliar to you if you're a visitor, is uh, we ask folks that may have a need that they want prayed for uh, during this time to just stand up, and you don't have to verbally say anything about the need, but that will give people around you an opportunity to gather around you and just comfort and support you. And after the service, those that know you can ask what that need is. So. If we have any folks that have needs uh, that they would like to be prayed over this morning, if you could just take this moment and stand up. I uh, appreciate that. It's really encouraging to me as a youth leader to see these children that were dedicated this morning. I can remember, I think I've been working with high school kids here since 2003, and some of the kids that we have in high school now, I remember when they were dedicated. Some of the kids that are in college, I remember when they were dedicated. It's just amazing to see the way God works in the lives of children, especially when parents are committed to putting God first in, our, in their own lives. So if we, we have somebody standing back there, someone can gather around. Some more folks standing over there. So um, things that we can be praying for this week. On Tuesday, the Senior Saints Day, they're going up to... Hidden Acres, it's going to be an awesome time. We just want to make sure that those folks know that we love them and value them. And also, uh, Bev Munsterman's having surgery this week, so keep her in your prayers as well. So I invite you to just join me now as we pray. Just ask for God's blessing on our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all the amazing and abundant blessings you've given us. God, it's easy to get wrapped up in all the things that are going on this time of year with changing of the seasons and harvest, school back in session and really hitting its stride and sporting events and extracurriculars and things for the kids. God, it's so easy to get busy and to forget about you and the busyness of life. Lord, we just pray that we would take time to rest. We would take time to acknowledge the many blessings that you've given us. God, we know that this life is not always easy. There are challenges. But we know, Lord, that you are with us every step of the way. You promise you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. We just thank you for that. Lord, today, for those that are standing, we pray that whatever the needs may be, you already know what those needs are, and you have a plan for their lives. God, we just pray that we as a body will be supportive. Lord, we pray that through whatever we go through in our own lives, we can be an example to others of what grace is like, what total dependence upon you is like. Lord, we pray for safety for the folks going with Dane this week up to Senior Saints Day. God, we just pray they'll have a wonderful day of rejuvenation, a, a time of encouragement, just a day of joy for them. God, we thank you for those senior saints here in our church that have been such an example uh, for so many years to so many of us, God. We just praise you for them and their dedication to you and to this church. Lord, we pray for Bev as she has surgery this week. We just pray you'll lift her up, 
that she can know that you are with her and she's comforted during that time. We pray for her recovery, uh, that you will make it as quick and as painless as possible, Lord. God, we pray for all the children of this church. The world is a desperately evil place. And we know that without you in their lives, it's so easy for children to become lost in every sense of the word. So Lord, we just pray that we as a church body can love and support the children in this church and the families in this church. That this church can be a place where children are encouraged to grow closer to you. Where children are encouraged to make you the priority in their lives. God, we know if we do that, that you will, you will be with those kids and wherever they may go and that they will continue to spread your word throughout this world. Lord, we thank you for the parents here in this church that have made decisions over the years to put you first in their lives and by doing so to put you first in their children's lives by example. We just pray you'll continue to strengthen us as parents as we lead our children through these dark times. Let us always give you the honor and glory. Lord, we pray for Dane as he brings us the message this morning. We just pray that whatever you place on his heart, you give him the right words to say, that you will open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the message that he brings. God, we want to know you better. We want to serve you better. We want to love you, and we want to love others. So Lord, we just pray that that would be our, our goal in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
song has actually got a prayer part to it where it's a request that we're making, Spirit, take me deeper. And I pray that that would be the prayer of your heart as well. Thanks to our worship team uh, for leading us uh, this morning. I, I need to ask for your forgiveness. I caved in this week and um, uh, basically uh, caved into temptation. Um, I started looking at the forecast. The building was getting chilly. And still in September, I turned the heat back on. And so uh, elders meet tomorrow. They're going to take my Dutch card away. But um, I, 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 guess I sought professional help, professional assistance. But um, for some of you in here, I saw you going like this, like it was still too cold. Um, for those of you going through midlife, you're saying, why on earth didn't you turn the air on this morning? So anyway, sorry about that. Hey, uh, I got a picture on the screen for you. Um, Hidden Acres is our district camp, for those of you who are our guests here. Um, it uh, is uh, Pride of Jewel. You go on Highway 30 to the Ogden exit. Uh, go north on that road for about 15 miles. You come to Hidden Acres. It's just outside of Dayton, um, Iowa. But anyway, that tree on the left is our prayer tree. In 1979, a group of individuals sat under that massive tree and basically prayed, Lord, is this the land that you want the district to have for a district camp. And uh, they, they felt the sense of the Holy Spirit saying yes. And so basically they contacted the district, all the churches, and said, we're doing a buy the acre fund. So you buy an acre. This is how much it costs. We divided it by the 640 acres. And um, by October, it was paid for, and the land was ours. And uh, unfortunately, um, that uh, prayer tree has been a symbol up until this past year. Uh, I can remember being the camp pastor on several occasions. We'd take groups of kids out to the prayer tree, do a bonfire, and that's where I'd present the gospel, and we had people uh, come to Christ under that tree. Um, but age took a tear of it. Um, some of those limbs were 30, 40 feet, you know, just horizontal out from the tree, and it took a toll, and it died. But uh, on the right there, you now see what's happened uh, uh, to the prayer tree. But um, I, I bring this up. Uh, Hidden Acres, uh, since 79, now has become the largest Christian uh, camp in Iowa. As far as the number of people that uh, go there, as far as the number of buildings that are there, as far as the number of heated buildings that are there, um, it's amazing. But uh, it was a record-setting summer. Listen to this. At our camp this summer, 2,516 kids went to camp during a six-week period of time. There was one week they had over 600 kids on there. Add to that the 157 staff people um, that basically are there during camp uh, during the summer. And so uh, that week there was over 750 people on the camp. 128 children gave their hearts to Christ at camp this summer. 128. Well, if God doesn't deserve a hand for that, then I don't know what he deserves. 87 students, uh, children, gave, uh, uh, recommitted their life to serving uh, Christ. Um, this past weekend, so last weekend, um, there were 600 plus people on the grounds. The salt uh, ministry freshmen were there. Valley Efree middle schoolers were there. The Ames Chinese Efree Church was there doing a church retreat. And the Nebraska Christian basketball team was there at Hidden Acres. And that's just one weekend. And so you can see it's not just summer, but it's uh, all year long that um, the place is, is uh, basically, um, and, and Steve uh, sat in the chair on the porch uh, last weekend, and this big old college athlete came up to him and basically shared how he was there last year um, as a freshman at Salt and was back this year bringing people, and he had surrendered his life to Christ um, during that time. So praise, praise the Lord uh, for that. If you brought your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. For those of you who are guests, um, one of my practices is to preach through a book of the Bible. And uh, we're, we're just going section by section through 1 Peter, and we're at, uh, at the end of 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, 
One of the things that athletes or musicians or other people do not like doing is all the repetitious stuff. Um, football is the drills. One of the things I used to say when I was coaching is the things you hate that make you great. It's those drills and drills and repetitions and repetitions and show choir. It's the choreography and getting every single move down to an exact science. And marching band is those wonderful dot books and making sure that your feet. Why? Because the judges are looking at those things. And, and so sometimes you can just say, oh, why do we have to keep doing that kind of stuff? And sometimes when you're in the scriptures, you can feel the same way. Okay, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 3, you've got all this practical stuff. We, we've talked about personal holiness. In, um, in verses 11 and 12 is sort of the, the key, if not to the chapter, to the whole um, uh, book of 1 Peter. It says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you, even as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Uh, good works leads to goodwill, which leads to good news. Um, in chapter 2, we talked about uh, the Christian and government. In chapter 2, we talked about Christian and work. In chapter 3, next week, we're going to go into marriage. But today, it's going to be uh, sort of like that repetition. Because basically, um, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, using Christ as an example, that's his purpose. Uh, I want you to submit just as Christ did. I want you to suffer just as Christ did. But in the midst of that, giving him an example, he lists some very, very critical, essential doctrine regarding Christ that is so important. And many people, when they think doctrine, they're like, oh, that head stuff. No, doctrine is not head stuff. And basically what I want to do is I want to look at this passage and I want to say, this is the doctrine, and this is why it matters. Because it's critical. Doctrine is what separates what's truly Christian, separates who Jesus truly is, from what he is not. And we live in a culture that has all sorts of ideas about what Christianity and what Jesus is. And so we need to go back to God's word constantly and remind ourselves, no, no, this is what the Bible says. The culture can say whatever they want, but they're not saying what the, the, the God's Word says. And so let's, let's take a look at that. Um, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 21. And once again, he's using Christ's example, but in the midst of this, he makes some very uh, clear statements about who Christ is. He says, For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. And now verse 22, we start this doctrinal section. He, referring to Christ, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He, Christ, himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You need to understand one thing in this section. Basically, Peter has his one eye on Isaiah 53 and one eye on his writing. Um, look at this next picture. Do you, do you know that you can get um, specialized contact lenses? Yeah. Now, I have not consulted with our resident optometrists, Dr. Jones and Dr. Jones. So I am not promoting these. But I'm saying they're available. The one on the left basically has Vikings. You got this uh, fanatic Vikings fan who can't uh, just uh, paint his face, but he's got to have Vikings contact lenses. And then, the, uh, the one on the right, that's cool. Green UV glow-in-the-dark contacts. So that you can really freak someone out uh, when you go around a corner in the dark. When Peter writes verses 21 through 25, he's wearing contacts that basically have Isaiah 53 on. In fact, he quotes it sometimes, but he's always referring to it. 
And so I, in order for us to get the sense of what he's writing about and to get a sense of, oh, this is taught in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I'm going to have you read a part of Isaiah 53 out loud. So let's go to the next slide. Let's read this out loud because I'm going to be referring to it in the next few minutes as I, as I preach. Let's read this out loud together. This is Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and following. And this is basically a prediction of who Christ would be and what Christ would do. The Messiah. Okay, let's read. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he not opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put, has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. In this passage, I believe Peter shares four crucial truths about Christ that you need to understand. It's the essence of the gospel. It's the essence of what Christianity is all about. No matter what the culture says about Jesus, no matter what the culture says about Christianity, this is the essence. And basically what Peter is doing is reiterating what Isaiah 53 taught. Number one, you've got to understand the essence of Jesus Christ. In order for him to be a satisf satisfactory substitute, it says here, Jesus committed no sin. Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. The New Testament affirms over and over again, in several places, his sinlessness. He was completely God, completely man, can't comprehend that completely. But in his humanity, he was sinless. Why is that important beyond just a doctrinal fact? The reason it is important is because the scripture said only a perfect sacrifice will satisfy God's wrath. Only a perfect sacrifice will satisfy God's requirements for the forgiveness of sins. We see this in, in 2 Corinthians. Um, you, you guys have seen this before. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, in fact, uh, we sing a song about it. For our sake, he, referring to Jesus, made him, or God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew, K-N-E-W, knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so Jesus committed no sin. And why is that important? Because it had to be a perfect sacrifice. And so basically, because he committed no sin, he was that. Secondly, Peter declares, just as Isaiah chapter 53 declares, and Isaiah 53 fills his mind, Christ was our substitute before a holy God. Look at verse 24, the beginning of it. Get back there in a second. 
Verse 24. He himself, referring to Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree. Basically what he is saying is, Christ, when he was on the cross, bore our sins. This is the heart of the gospel. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4, it says, He has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him. He was stricken, he was smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, basically uh, 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 the nails of the hands, the nails of the feet. He was crushed for our iniquities. And then it says this, Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. I always thought the picture when I was younger of Jesus hanging on the cross and just the fact that he endured the physical pain and that he bled was the total picture, the total story about what Christ did on the cross. But as you read scripture, as you say, yes, that's a very, very important thing. He shed his blood. He was the perfect sacrifice. But something else happened on that cross. While he was in that tremendous physical pain, three hours of darkness, boom, lights out, middle of the day. And scripture tells us that during those three hours, wave after wave after wave of God's judgment, anger towards sin was poured out on the sun. He was our substitute. That anger and wrath should have been poured out on us. But instead, he bore our sins. God's wrath towards sin was poured out on the sun. He bore those. Critical. Why does this matter? It matters because it emphasizes the truth that you and I, through morality, through religion, and through good works, can't earn salvation. You and I can't, through our good works, morality, and religion, somehow earn God's favor. What you need to understand is God has already accomplished that through making Christ our substitute. And so that is why Christ is so important. Third, Christ's finished work on the cross provides spiritual life. Look at the end of verse 24. By his wounds you have been healed. Quote from Isaiah 53. Basically, what does it mean? You're healed. You, you experience a spiritual healing. You experience forgiveness. You experience reconciliation with God because before Christ... Uh, you were in an irreconcilable relationship with God. Your sin had separated you from God. But because of what Christ has done, you can experience reconciliation. You can experience adoption, where you actually become a child of God. You can experience justification, where basically God says, I declare them no longer guilty of their sins. From this day forward, not guilty. You, uh, you basically uh, can experience um, eternal life. And you're also declared righteous. When God looks at you, he sees not you. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his sinlessness in you. Because Christ's blood has covered you. So why does it matter? Because your entire purpose in life is to be in relationship with God. And then last, we can experience this. You must respond. Look at verse 25. For you were straying like sheep. That's right from Isaiah 53. But you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer your souls. Throughout scripture, the facts are given about Jesus. But you must respond to those facts. You must respond to Christ. You must realize, okay, Christ was my substitute. I must respond to that by faith and cherish him for what he has done. And so you respond, simple faith. It can be a prayer. It can just be an acknowledgement of not just a mental idea of who Christ is, but a heart idea of 
Lord Jesus, I need you because you are the only Savior. Stuart McAllister is uh, doing one of our Sunday school classes this, uh, this week and last week um, in our um, Everyday Questions class. And there was a quote that he made, I think, that basically defines uh, what our culture, how our culture views Christianity and how they view Jesus. He says this, Many people in the question of meaning in life and also in the question of what Christianity is often try to present Christianity as a system of morality. Doing religious things, being good, and in doing this you will experience the meaning of life and God will instantly accept you for the good that you have done. To which he responds, Christ did not come to make bad people good. The scriptures say we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all bad. Christ did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And it's only through Christ and because of his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross that we can experience new life. The other great news about this from this passage is Isaiah 53 is it basically says we can experience healing. Um, the good news is this your past doesn't matter. Your past doesn't matter. What really matters is how are you going to respond to Christ today? Because Christ has already paid the price for your past. You don't got to get cleaned up first. And so many people, because of their past, will say, well, no, God can never accept me. And my response will be, Christ's death on the cross more than paid the penalty of your past. So I invite you come to Christ. Worship team, come on up. I'm sure you can come forward. Let's bow our hearts and minds in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this good news that we've just read about. Because, quite frankly, because of my past, and also because of my present, there's no way that I could ever be good enough to constantly be accepted by you through my own efforts. What a, what a freeing truth that is that I don't have to. My past and my present and future sins have already been forgiven. Christ bore them on the cross two centuries ago. And Lord, I pray that everybody here would have a confidence in knowing Christ and what Christ has done. Father, yes, we thank you for those doctrinal portions of Scripture. They are so important because basically they allow us to discern between truth and between error. And Lord, one of the biggest errors in Christianity today is, is that I have to work for my salvation. Every other religion around has the basis of working for salvation. Lord, I thank you that because of what Christ has done, works are few. And Lord, we can bask in knowing that you have already declared us righteous for those who know Christ. So Lord, I pray this would be refreshment for our souls. And I pray for anybody who has never made a commitment to Jesus would understand that Jesus was a sinless substitutionary sacrifice. And we need him in order to be saved. Lord, Holy Spirit, do a work in each of our hearts and minds, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have questions about uh, what Christ has done, if you'd like to talk to someone regarding, um, I want to take that step, I'm still not sure how to do that, um, I invite you to come see me, see Pastor Rob, see one of our elders, um, and uh, we'd be more than happy just to answer your questions um, without any kind of of guilt or shame uh, associated with that.
going to, as the, the ushers are going to take our offering, but as they, they take the offering this morning, uh, I wanted to share a new song with you. It's one that we learned at Challenge, and uh, it's just a beautiful song that uh, hopefully this morning, as, as, as Pastor Dan shared, um, we make a choice, and the choice would simply be this, to run towards Jesus. Um, maybe we've never made that choice. Um, maybe we've we've chose to follow Christ, but you know our life isn't where it should be right now, and we need to get back on track. Um, what this song is just is, is purely saying is a declaration of I'm going to choose to run back to Jesus uh, because He's who I need. So uh, I just invite you to sing uh, along with us this morning.
we're gonna we're gonna close our service just singing a, a familiar hymn. And let's just uh, as we're closing and, and just kind of reflecting on what what God has done for us. Let's just praise Him with the truth that that Jesus paid it all. There's nothing left for me to do. God's done all the work. And uh, man, how awesome is that?
who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. May those truths speak loudly to you throughout this week. God bless you. You are dismissed. Please greet one another. Soon.